Okay, we can't see you guys, so if you just like make sure that you uh, get somebody to say something. I'm here. If you have a question or concern, I, since we had to wait anyway, I just wanted to make sure we had some time to some time. talk. Here we go. Whatever, so. Go ahead. Well, I just want to say thank you, Z, <laughs> for oh. making that. Yeah. <laughs> memories, memories. <laughs> thank you. I, I'm going to out her and tell that she's like one of the biggest supporters of this film. She really, you know, has been there. Uh, she came through in the clutch with a lot of the photographs that we have in the film because everybody said, oh yeah, I got pictures, but nobody actually um, would find them for me. <laughs> and she was one of the few people who did and she supported the film in so many ways. So I appreciate you, Julie. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to make the film. Hi there. Um, I just, I just want to first of all just uh, recognize black excellence on you guys are just really wonderful. So thank you. Yeah. What's come across to me uh, that, that I would love for both of you to speak to that I, I've noticed hasn't really been um, a specific uh, topic, but if you could talk about, it, it's just so plain in, in what you're talking about here about recruiting people of color to be in the industry. That's my job. I work for Temple, and I'm constantly figuring out new ways to recruit um, people of color and women to be in film. It, it was an issue then. It's still an issue now about getting that representation. I hear students talk about that. If you could talk a little bit about how it played into the past and sort of how you sort of look at speaking to parents, black parents, <laughs> who sometimes are sort of, uh, it's kind of difficult to explain to them how they're really participating in history and art and all those sort of things. They don't see it that way unless they see a specific paycheck or a degree at the end of it. Can you talk about how to sort of connect your experience of how, sort of how you were recruited to be able to create this art and how that plays into today. You want me to start with the old days? <laughs> <laughs> See, Zainabu, I asked her, did, did she want me to start with the old days? Zainabu is like the baby of the group. <laughs> I mean, she came in um, like, almost like, almost like four years after me, something like that, at UCLA, so. Um, but I know for me, um, when I started um, um, studying film, it was in New York at the Studio Museum of Harlem, and there was, uh, the program began because of the riots that were had in, I think it's 1965-66 in Newark, New Jersey, and in Harlem. So a lot of money was put into the, um, community programs, and one of those programs was a film program at the Studio Museum of Harlem, so it got like seven students off the street. No one was really interested in uh, filmmaking at the time, not many people, let's say. Um, you know, by the time I, um, after, after undergraduate school, I went to Los Angeles because I had been reading about Larry Clark and Hiley and, and Charles Burnett. And I, I applied to uh, AFI and got in right away because there were only 18 people <laughs> who applied and I think they let us all in <laughs> that year at um, AFI. And then after that I went to UCLA and there was absolutely no difficulty getting in in 1976 because it wasn't trending. And uh, so I, I was very, very fortunate. I was able to um, go in under the radar. But things changed once I, I graduated and made films. But you can pick it up. I'm going to take a slightly different tack to, the, to answer the question, too, and um, agree with Julie that um, it's difficult, and I heard you say temple, and I heard you say parents, and as an auntie of some future owls, I want to say, here's my owl. There they are, there's my owls over there. <laughs> I want to just answer it from the professor-parent perspective um, and say that, um, yes, it is st still very difficult um, to break into the industry 
it's not the easiest industry to become a part of. I have students who graduate now um, and still spending five years as a production assistant, which is really, really horrendous because usually production assistants go, don't get paid, period, or they get paid very, very low amounts. So the problem is that it has become even more competitive than it was in the past. But here's the flip side of it, is that as parents, and I'm, I'm telling you from my own daggone experiences, I'm sure Julie can say the same thing, you have to let your kids do what it is that they want to do and what they love. And if their passion is in creating media or doing something in the arts, then please try as much as you can. And you know, don't, don't clean out the basement because they're probably going to have to go back and live in it or, or their room. <laughs> but let them do what it is that they want to do, even if it's not making money or, or, or they're not doing what you wish that they would do. Um, or they could do financially at the time. Because what is most important? To be doing something you love and be happy or to be doing something that you hate and then just you know go nuts because you're making all this money but you just can't figure out how to find happiness. So that's one thing that I would say. I don't necessarily know that things are better in this industry but I do know that the more of us keep pushing and trying to get into the door um, in whatever ways it is, if we take the independent route, if we take the Hollywood, if we take a television route, whatever, it will get better if we keep on pushing. And so that's the takeaway that I want, want you to pass to your um, students and your students' parents. We've got one more here and then I think we'll be ready. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm up here. <laughs> I don't know if you can see oh, me. Oh, I see you there. Okay. Can you see me? I think so. <laughs> um, well, anyway, I just wanted to ask uh, if you had any advice for someone transitioning out of school and going into the film world um, as a young black woman. Which film world? There's so many different tracks you could take. You could be a non-theatrical filmmaker. You could be working in commercials, music videos, or doing um, films for museums or for corporate, doing corporate industry films. So I would say um, creativity as like social activism or creating something that you feel like the world needs to hear. Is that, is that helpful? No. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's say non-theatrical then. Okay. okay. The world is your oyster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, there are many paths you can take. You could work for corporations. You could work for uh, grassroots organizations, social activist organizations, and just tell those stories. You could do um, uh, short video webisodes. You could do pretty much anything and everything that you please. But if I were you, if I were doing that, I would create my own company and then from there begin to, you know, seek work um, to bring into my own company and just make it and put it on and sell it to various websites or, or to various entities, corporate entities. And the only thing I would add on to that is, is you know, as much as the mainstream industry likes to try to um, push like the name of one person, um, it's never one person that's doing this work. It's always a group or it's always some kind of small team, collective, whatever. So what I would say is, you know, try to, building off of what Julie said, is try to align yourself and get yourself with a group of people who want to do the same things that you want to do so that you can help each other out. So if you can form either a collective or an organization or like Julie's saying, like a business, a, a company or something like that, that would be the best way, I think, to try to approach it because you're going to get beat down a lot and you need another group or you need some folks to kind of like keep you going and, 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 and to hold each other up. So if you can do it as a group, um, and maybe you can, if you're here in Philly, you, you know, you can always go to Scribe or some other place 
that will also help you figure out how to um, move on that path, okay? Okay, so this is, it. this is the last question now, and then Steph Renee, and you guys will come back for the, for the full Q&A after, but this is, a, this is the last question. Just real quick, I was just wondering, is it possible to get access to all those films? Are they, or are some of them lost forever, or how does a person watch everything from the rebellion? I don't know, the UCLA archives has uh, restored a whole lot of them and they're doing, making a DVD or Blu-ray collection now, or you can, um, you could view some of them, uh, there's Women Make Movies. Are you familiar with um, like non-theatrical distributors of uh, independent films? Not by name, no. Okay, well there, there are many of them, you know, Third World Cinema, Third World News, with California Newsreel, um, there are many of them all across the country. And also, so you could Google those, and you should also Google, um, uh, just, just Google like directors, or a, a directors or corporate directors, and, and you could go to various websites and see what people are doing, because you, you're not aware of how many filmmakers are out there um, making commercials you know, Coca-Cola commercials, or you know, Pepsodent, or whatever, Colgate, whatever, and you could see the work of um, directors working in those fields, and they, and they make a lot of money. Uh, but you just don't know it, and you don't know them because they don't run credits after commercials. So that's a very lucrative career to go into, and you work all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, oh, yeah. Okay, I'll, do, yeah, I'll, make it, I'll just make it quick, just in case some people don't, go, don't hear the answer. Um, <laughs> The, uh, what Julie said, the, there's gonna be a DVD set of our short films that will be available. The, 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 the catch is that you won't be able to get it as individuals. It will only be made available to public libraries and uh, universities and, and K through 12 schools. So that would be a way. The other, if you're specifically interested in the UCLA directors, if you go to the UCLA Film and Television Archives um, website, there is a, a tab there for the LA Rebellion films. In the LA Rebellion films, there is a list of all of the filmmakers who have been associated with the movement so far. You can click on their names and you can see their titles, and in some cases, there's just a few of them, you can also see some of their earlier works. So that's a place that you can go and see some of the work if you're interested. All right, you guys, thank you for your patience and we'll, we'll pick up where we left off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know that we are short on time, so I just want to um, go ahead and get started if that's okay with you. My name is Stephanie Renee. I'm the program director and host of The Mojo on 900 AM WURD. <laughs> and very thankful to ask a few more questions. But for those of you who have taken African dance, I hope you'll give me one brief indulgence because I must. Because that's the kind of spirit that they infuse into their work. <sighs> All right, so um, we've already had some wonderful questions from the audience. I want to, um, just kind of talk a little bit about this idea of movement because it was such uh, a necessary theme of, of this work. And, and so the first question really is, is what's in a name? Uh, I had the pleasure of throwing together my own guerrilla documentary uh, a little more than a decade ago now, which is crazy to me, called No Such Thing as Neo Soul. Because here in Philadelphia, um, this was considered to be one of the epicenters of that movement, um, but the artists themselves had a real problem with the title um, because they saw themselves as a continuation of what had come before, not necessarily a new thing. Um, but Kedar Massenberg, who was managing Maxwell and D'Angelo and, uh, and Erica Badu, um, coined the term in order to help market it. So, especially for you, Mr. Nabu, given the, the um, creating this film that talks about um, this group of filmmakers and, and continuing that legacy, do you have different thoughts? And, and, and you too, Ms. Dash, especially because you were a part of this movement, um, 
have you become more comfortable with, with the term LA Rebellion now uh, in the way that it's allowed this work to now speak to uh, a new generation of folks? Oh. Well, other than the name sounding like it came from, you know, Harper's Ferry, the LA <laughs> I, I, I never, I didn't have a problem with it because I, I remember when uh, Clyde Taylor gave that talk at the Whitney and it was called the LA Rebellion and we just kind of laughed at it and then, but then later, because other people were calling it the Los Angeles School, in Tagila Masalela wrote a uh, wonderful paper on it and he called us the Los Angeles School. So, um, so the LA Rebellion moniker is, is really kind of new. Mm -hmm. It's when the UCLA archives decided to, you know, put our films together as a collection and he called it the LA Rebellion. So I see it as an homage to um, uh, Clyde Taylor articulating um, our work as a, as, as a movement. So I, I really don't have a problem with it. It just sounds a little bit like someone has a pitchfork and a torch and meeting at Harper's Ferry at midnight. Yeah, I would just echo the same thing that Julie does. I, you know, I'm from Philly, so most of y'all know, yeah. like, rebel, you know, that's, <laughs> and I ain't got a problem with it. But other filmmakers did, so in the, in the film, that was one of the first things that we wanted to make sure that we got out, was that people know that there's no collective agreement on what the name of the group is, but this is the one that kind of stuck. So that's what that was about. And personally, I don't care what you call us as long as you realize that we existed and that we are a significant part of American independent cinema history, or American film history, period. Um, Mike Dennis and I um, do a show on Fridays on Word, uh, Real Black Radio, that talks about this idea of film as a movement, film as a tool. And so with the tragedies that we have seen take place in the black community, particularly over the last three years, I wonder um, if you all have reframed in some way the role of the filmmaker in a society where documenting our lives has become, it, it still isn't a tool for justice yet, but it has definitely been a, a much more prevalent tool for documentation of what has happened to us. So telling these stories has been profoundly moving and making sure that we're capturing things like documentaries where we understand the history, but video now as a tool is, is literally a matter of life and death capturing that. lean forward. Well, yeah, that's true, but in a way, I always knew that it was, and that's why I pretty much was drawn to filmmaking so much, because it's, um, it's a way of a reframing and redefining the narrative of your life of, uh, uh, and your legacy and, and of your community and, and cultural tradition. So I think we pretty much knew that, but Yes, it is, it's vital now to document um, things that are happening um, on the streets, but um, I think we were already on that same trajectory, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, in the, with the, one of the earlier questions, you talked about um, window of opportunity in terms of your fellowship and applying to film school mm -hmm. and how that worked. Um, and, and juxtaposing that against uh, part of what was covered in the film about um, sort of creating that network that could sustain a lot of this independent film moving forward. Um, would you advise a lot of these young independent filmmakers that are here at the festival this week to take the window um, and, and appreciate uh, any window of opportunity for what it's worth? Um, or I think there's some people that might get really caught up in this idea of creating that system, whether it's distribution or uh, production studios that can help sustain the movement for the, the long haul. W what is your advice in that regard? Well, I think um, we're at a moment in time with the coming of Ava DuVernay 
when all things and everything is changing. And I think we need to take advantage of this time in her movement and, and how she has assisted us in opening doors and making, pushing forward. Um, because of course she is also being assisted by Ofer, who has embraced her and that's all a good thing. Um, as Jamal Fanaka was out there alone. No one reached forward to uh, assist him and he needed assistance. Um, so, um, I think that things are changing now and we could be, we could look back to the past and, you know, respect that, but at the same time, all things are different. And, um, there's a giant movement going forward right now and we should take advantage of that and young filmmakers should take advantage of that and not don't pay any attention to a lot of that and just move forward because things are different. But I'll only disagree with you on one part of his is um, don't pay attention but remember oh, yeah, what remember, it was. But don't be hampered by it. Exactly. Don't be, um, exactly. constrained by it. Don't exactly. be frightened by what we went through. That's yeah. our story, it's not your story. Right, yeah. but know where we came from so that yeah. you can use it and push and, and move forward uh, ahead. Uh, I'll just latch on really quickly and say that we need people on all different fronts. You know, we need people doing stuff within the industry. We need people doing stuff on the more independent front. We need people doing stuff in, in uh, academia or, um, you know, community organizations, et cetera. So we need people involved with black culture, not just black film, but black culture in general on many different fronts. So whatever it is that we all can do to be a part of that, that's what will make us all move forward as a country. And I, I, yeah, I was gonna say there, like one more question. Our time is short, so I'll ask. I'm glad that you brought up Ava DuVernay because um, I was really struck in, in watching this documentary of the idea of how groundbreaking Daughters of the Dust was. I know how viscerally it moved me and how necessary it was, but to think that in a 19 anything, especially the late 1900s, that we're talking about the first woman to receive major distribution for a film. Um, just uh, last week it was announced that Ava DuVernay is the first black woman director to ever be given a hundred million dollar budget for the film A Wrinkle in Time that she's currently working on. And when she got the Golden Globe nomination, um, one of the things she said very clearly was, um, I wish that we weren't still talking about firsts exactly. here in 2015, 16. Exactly, because when Daughters of the Dust um, got this, its theatrical distribution before me, there was Jessie Maple. She had a feature film called Will, and then there was uh, Kathleen Collins Prettyman. She had um, McCabe, um, uh, Losing Ground, yes. and Cruz Brothers, and Mrs. Malloy. Yes. Yeah. There were women making feature films. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I, on behalf of the whole audience, I just want to say thank you for reminding us of not just your gift, but the responsibility that we all have to make sure that voices aren't continually silenced because of our apathy and not going to see them when they are theatrically released and whatever we can do to create them and to finance them and to make sure that more of this work continues to see the light. We all have a responsibility in making that happen. So please continue to do what you do. And if we do what we're supposed to do, then we'll all be better for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, everyone. We have a screening coming up, so we need to do the Black Star Line. One, you want to take? Zinnabu, we could do whatever you want to do. You want to take one? Oh, absolutely. So we're going to take a question from the audience.
So who is it? Who is it? What? Okay, we, maybe. We, okay. Um, there's a lot of young um, people in the audience here, a lot of young women and males, and the whole festival has been awesome, and everyone wants inspiration. I wanted to hear, um, like, the young lady tried to expand on, like, some things that young people need, and we understand the struggle that you went through, and they have a lot of tools that they're not aware that they, they have access to. So maybe if you can expand a little bit on some of the tools that the young people uh, could use, because a lot of them are young and, you know, coming, you have a lot of experience, so just something that can give them some direction, and also myself, I'm like, I'm starting out doing things, but um, just something that, you know, you don't think of because we're, you know, struggling to find, to, to get our films or uh, okay. art out. Yeah, there was a panel earlier today called By Indie Means Necessary. How many of you attended that panel? Great. Okay, they were talking about making um, films using your iPhone. And for the last two years, I've been teaching courses at Morehouse and College of Charleston on using uh, iPhones and smartphone, any kind of smartphone, Android or ISO technology to make films. So you no longer need to wait until you can afford a DSLA camera or anything. Just reach into your pocket, pull out your phone, and make your film. Anytime, any place, write your script, whether it's documentary, narrative, or what, or what have you, and use that. And you can, there are also iPhone film festivals that you could submit your work to and start moving along and with, the and with the short films that you make using your smartphone, whatever one you choose, uh, you um, can start getting grants and with your film festival participation and with your short film. So you're creating co creative content, your own voice, and so start using that. Uh, go to your local scribe they have here in Philadelphia, uh, your community workshops to learn how to make films. I started making films when I was in high school at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, we use 16 millimeter equipment there, but now you could use your smartphone. So there's really, those are some of the tools that you have available to you. And the quick thing that I will add to that is, um, it's kind of a silly thing, but and I know it's expensive to go to a movie theater, but watch films on the big screen when you can. Um, I know it's very easy to watch stuff on your computer, and some people even watch them on their phones, but there is nothing like seeing a film with an audience. So if you can, it's a very different experience to actually have your work projected and to see how people respond to it. So that's something that I wanna make sure that you understand as a part of you becoming um, a, a filmmaker, you should also make sure that you project your work, even when it's a work in progress, you should project it, but that you should also go see films in a theater because ultimately that's what your goal probably is for what, how you want your work to be seen. So I, have, <laughs> so I have a question. Um, we talked a lot about distribution. Um, when you think about music in the past, let's say five or 10 years, um, distribution has changed like immensely. Um, it became something you buy at a store and then you just download for 99 cents, maybe 129 or something like that. I say all that to um, ask, in the next five years, do you think there will even be a need for mass distribution on these companies that come out considering that you have technology that basically can just buy a camera and take pictures and take um, film and put it up on you know, a screen yourself? Do you think distribution would change and will that affect the independent, um, the independent market for African Americans um, and would that give it a wider and even international base in um, probably the next five or ten years? What do you think? 
Absolutely. Uh, distribution has been changing. Distribution is currently changing Hollywood right now. I mean, Netflix, Hulu, Fandor, and all of those, they're knocking um, the cable stations in the Hollywood studios, you know, down. Um, in the next five, ten years, you know, distribution will be via satellite. So you won't even need to have um, iTunes or so. It's just going to change. It just keeps changing, and that's a good thing, and it keeps leveling the playing field. Um, if you're interested in distribution, then follow that trajectory. Um, and you, there's a lot of reading that you could do about it. And um, uh, But I don't think you should wait and say, well, I'm going to wait until distribution becomes, you know, easier or fair. Just make the films that you want to make. Make them now. You know, start building a, your body of work. And I'll just add that you just, we, we need people in all aspects of this work or this industry, this media. So if you are interested in the distribution, please, we sure enough need some folks. Because what happens is you have knuckleheads that, um, you know, Julie has a film done or whatever, and then she has to go with whoever to say, okay, how are we gonna do this? And you got, you know, guys up in the office, well, we have no idea how we could imagine ourselves as this, this, this character, you know? They, so we need people in the rooms, we need people in the spaces to say, yeah, hell yeah, we know that so-and-so is gonna go watch this movie and it's gonna make some money if that's what you have to do. We, you know, so that's, we, we need people in all parts of the game. Can I extend upon that? One of the things that um, Barbara and I did, Barbara McCullough, when we were at UCLA, we started going to international film festivals to pursue more information about distribution. And, and at these international film festivals, they have film markets. And so one of the first places we went was to the Cannes International Film Festival and went into the market. And then we would go into the Germany and stuff like that, where you could sell directly. You have to know, um, the territories and you have to make contact with them and then you could sell directly to them if you choose to. And that was just very liberating to know that you don't have to pick up the phone and try to call and beg someone to buy your film. If you have creative content, people will buy it. Go, <laughs> go outside of this country. Okay, before we let you go, I wanted to just um, do some thank yous, please. Um, first person who I need to thank, because this film would not be done, uh, besides Julie, who's here, um, the film wouldn't have been done without Julie, for sure, um, is, is, is another local, well, relatively local filmmaker, um, a director in her own right. Um, but she was so, so, she came through in the clutch. Uh, and that's Giovanna Chesler. So I wanted to recognize her for her wonderful editing um, that she, she contributed. And this time last year, I was about ready to just give up and G came through. So thank you again, G. Yeah. Okay, and um, my personal promoter uh, is here tonight, who I didn't realize I had, is another Philly filmmaker. And it also goes to prove that the LA Rebellion is multi-ethnic. So I'm just gonna out her right now, cause she already outed me <laughs> on social media and say thank you, Miss Erica Cho. <laughs> <laughs> Another wonderful Philly-based experimental filmmaker who I have the pleasure of teaching with at UCSD. And I think she's seen this film probably four or five times. Every time it plays in public, she's there, and she's just putting stuff up for me on social media, so thank you, sister. I, you know I appreciate you, so. Um, and then um, one last group that I have to thank. Um, some of you were here last night, have um, met my brother Kevin, who, um, I said it last night, I ain't gonna say it exactly the same way, because I don't want the same thing to happen. But um, he has helped me. Uh, with my filmmaking processes in more ways than you can imagine. But he was also an actor in, a, in one of my films, Compensation. He played the character of Tyrone. So I wanted to say thank you to him. So we could just recognize. 
And, and then lastly, I just want to say, um, I want my cousins and my nephew and well, my cousin, my youngest cousin and my niece, niece and nephews to come down here for just one very quick minute. You guys are young, so get down here, please. <laughs> this is important. Okay, so this is William Davis, future Al. My temple people, please come forward and take care of him. <laughs> Hopeful writer in the family. This is Kayla Davis. This is my actress and dancer. So again, she's a first year temple. Please take care of her people. This is Kevin Davis. He's a, a sophomore. Um, and I think he might be a producer, but he's going to be a pharmacist too. So he, he's, he's, going to be the, he's going to be the financier uh, in, in a sense. And this is Matthew, and he might be just directing and taking care of everybody, Ma Matthew Davis. So I just wanted to tell them, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting it. And this is the award we won last night. I want you each to hold it. Okay. I want you each to hold it. I'm only giving them six years, maybe five years. So for Black Star 2020-21, meet your future part of the filmmaking process. So that was what I wanted to make sure they did. Yeah. Just give it back. <laughs> okay, and the very last thing is there is a book on the LA Rebellion filmmakers. The DVD set is coming out in the fall. Please ask your public library to uh, get it. It's not available for uh, individuals to buy because of the music licensing issues that is a, uh, revolved around it. If you want more information about Spirits of Rebellion, please sign up for my website, which is spiritsofrebellion.com, or you can like us on Facebook. So. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you. It became quite disingenuous for America to say to a segment of its population, the marginalized, oppressed black folk, we need your help to fight a war for democracy when black folk were not experiencing democracy in America. When the words little and purple are in the same sentence, you can only be talking about one guy and his prince. He said, yeah, yeah. He's looking for something to get into tonight, so I told Sheila to tell him to come down and check you out. And I was like, okay, cool. Obviously, Sheila E. relayed the message because he showed up. He and Rochelle Farrell, it was the same night I met Rochelle for the first time because they were hanging out and they came to my show. So in between sets, um, they had me go to this really dark room and sit down and rap with him and. And then I invited Cora and Raymond. Raymond went off and got something to eat, but Cora and I walked in and I got to talking with him and we were chilling. And he said he wanted to just do some jamming together. <laughs>